good afternoon everyone hello and welcome to the second session of the day 3 epsilon 22 myself kiran pal computer society vice chairperson at ieee sis gs first of all it makes me proud to say that india is celebrating its 76th independence day we as indians on behalf of the entire ieee sis gst pay respect to all the leaders who have fought bravely for our nation's freedom in the past a very happy independence day to everyone now we hope that epsilon 2022 has been a fantastic experience for everyone who was a part of it we are really pleased to have all the participants joining us but the journey isn't over yet we present to you our third and final session under computer society track an outlook on cyber security where we will be having a panel discussion with some incredible panelists across the globe i would now like to introduce you to all our panelists for the day starting with ms pamila gupta who is a cyber security and ai risk leader she is the founder in women in cyber security trusted ai affiliate group for building secure and resilient ai systems she is also the founding member of iot security foundation and is the chair of ieee sub committee on ai cyber security and cyber security next up we have chani seems who has been included in the top 15 most influential women in cyber security in 2019 and has won two information security leadership awards women information security professional and top top influencer in security and fire for 2019 she is ranked one in the once to watch category uk's leading expert in cyber security and infrastructure 2018 and 19 mr abbas kudrati who is an author and a long time cyber security practitioner and chief information security officer He is Microsoft Asia's lead chief cybersecurity advisor and also serves as an executive advisor to Deakin University and several universities and technology startups. Our next panelist is Dr. Gaurav Gupta, who is the first Indian to earn a doctorate in the field of digital forensics and was bestowed with the Young Scientist Award. of the indian science conference in 2010 by the man of science himself dr apj abdul kalam through his rich experience of 20 years gaurav is on a mission to create awareness about technological frauds in society and has been a mentor and guide to many research students and interns now i would now like to introduce our moderator for the day mr arya samar who is a rising senior at Pennsylvania State University majoring in information science and technology and minoring in security and risk analysis arya has also been an active ieee volunteer working at the student branch level as a chairperson and holding various positions at ieee bombay section as well as ieee region 10 asia pacific i welcome you all ma'am and sir Abbas sir, would you like to have speak few words regarding about the event or just general about myself? Yeah, sir. Anything you would like to. <laughs> uh, first of all, yeah, thank you for giving me this opportunity to join uh, such a esteemed panel. I mean, each uh, one of you are, uh, are are very professionals as well as uh, very well. in your own individual field all the way from pamela to dr gaurav to chani and uh, arya who is a buddy as well so it's really a pleasure to be here and uh, of course uh, uh, i'm looking forward for a great session and a q and a to share my insight uh, from my 25 years of journey within cyber security and information security and uh, yeah let's see how we go yeah thank you sir dr gaurav gupta sir would you like to have few words for your introduction yeah. so you know um good afternoon everyone thank you for the opportunity to interact today um, and you know as we are celebrating the independence day today 
uh, and we use digital technology a lot, right? Each one of us is totally dependent on digital technology. There is a lot of misuse which is happening. You know, there are a lot of cyber crimes which are happening today. So, you know, we need to make sure that, you know, our digital world is also freed from all kind of, uh, you know, incidences and all kind of crimes which are happening. And uh, uh, I have written a book, uh, Cyber Unsafe, in this connection where I have, you know, used short stories uh, and non-technical ways of avoiding cyber crimes. So, you know, this is an area which is extremely, extremely important and it has a lot of low hanging fruits where you can you can do research, you can uh, you can pick up new skills. So India as a country lacks, you know, five to ten lakhs people who are required in the area of cybersecurity, digital forensics and cyber laws and and, you know, in complete digital forensic investigation like cyber. So a so lot and lot uh, needs to be done. Uh, anybody who wants to take up this field, uh, you know, uh, will definitely see great heights. Uh, it's much less competitive compared to any other field which are saturated. And there are a lot of research opportunities. So, you know, I encourage each one of you to take up uh, research problems because this is a time when you can solve them very quickly and you can actually make your name into that. So I'm looking forward for discussion uh, and uh, I can be reached for any kind of uh, digital forensic uh, related research opportunities. I would be happy to mentor students also. Thank you. Yeah, very excited for this, sir. Pamela, ma'am, would you like to speak a few words? Yes, sure. Thank you for inviting me. Um, I'm based in Connecticut, USA, northeastern part of USA. My area of focus has been and continues to be creating security strategy for companies, um, which means taking a risk-based approach to understanding how to, as we're going through this whole digital transformation um, by fire, if you want to call it that, right? After COVID, everybody had to scramble and even people, who, uh, companies who were not ready to be digitally uh, transformed had to make that leap. And if the more the, uh, the more um, you rush into something, right, the, the, there is more risk, obviously, as well as a higher vulnerability. And, you know, you're just increasing the, the uh, in, uh, landscape for uh, risk for any company. So what I do is I work with companies. I have a, com a woman-owned company in based in Connecticut. And what we do is create a strategic approach because security is not something you want to partially achieve, right? You have to take a very um, conscious approach of what is the business? Where is the risk coming from? You now need to, to secure everything. Do you need a process? Do you need technology? And uh, most of all, a strategy. So that's that's uh, what I do and I'm very involved with IEEE for uh, next generation uh, security including um, artificial intelligence and IOT so I'll stop yeah Chani ma'am your few words please uh, thank you Pamela for Try, try without microphone or if you have an inbuilt microphone in your laptop also. No, not audible. Okay, she may rejoin. Yeah, sir. Now I would like to hand over the session to Arya, sir, to carry on. Okay. Hello everyone. While uh, Chani Man rejoins and she can give her introduction, just a quick introduction of myself. So my name is Arya. I'm a senior at Penn State. I'm inf uh, majoring in information science and technology and minoring in security. I think that's what you have heard. So the fun thing about today's session is uh, all the people, all the panelists here have more experience than I have lived. Okay. <laughs> so what is what makes me uh, 
I mean, why am I here is I think I'm just hosting everyone and I'm going to ask questions that you might have. And I have personally, I sneak a few private questions in the list. So that's my job. I'm going to ask everyone the questions and get the answers to y'all. So I'm really excited to learn from everyone because as I said, everyone is like more, way more experienced than I am. So really looking forward to everyone. Also, uh, I think Chani Ma'am has rejoined. So Chani Ma'am, would you like to give your introduction, please? Can you hear me now? Yeah, yeah, you're audible. Okay, that's good, thanks. Yeah. Please call me Chani. <laughs> I feel very out of my friends. Thank you for inviting me. Sorry, I, I had some technical issues um, joining. Um, so my, um, I'm based in uh, UK, in Devon, and uh, I am the managing director for a company called Meta Defence Lab. We are a certification body for the UK government's cyber stations and cyber stations plus key. Um, I'm also a um, the founder of She Sees or Exec, which is a give back initiative to create emotionally intelligent cybersecurity leaders. It's a global initiative, and uh, we've been running. Um, uh, five-day boot camps, um, uh, offering 100% scholarships to participants, and um, events around um, meetups and and mentoring calls to the community. So it's it's been quite popular in the industry, and uh, we are now uh, looking forward to doing more activities in the coming 12 months. Um, on my day job, apart from um, these things, I am. Um, um, I'm a consultant. I think that's where my path is. I, I came through the, as an IBM engineer, um, started as an IBM engineer in my career, and uh, came up the ladder uh, into starting my company, Meta Defense Labs, in 2015. So, uh, in that journey, I, I um, specialized in virtualization to infrastructure. Um, how do you design infrastructures in a secure manner? and also uh, specializing in security. So I work as a virtual CISO at the moment uh, and also a consultant. So uh, like Pamela was saying, I am also interested in uh, helping organizations um, to understand what their risks are, what they do, uh, what their compliance requirements are and designing their strategy and executing that strategy and, and building any security programs for companies. So that's um, sort of my consultancy role. Um, and then I also um, do other engagements like um, speaking engagements and also uh, monitoring activities. I'm, I'm a judge to certain uh, organizations for their awards. Uh, so I get involved in those things as well. Um, if, I'm, if I am to uh, say where I'm specialized in, I'm more of a journalist. But I am specialized in um, cyber centuries, cyber centuries plus ISM framework, and also ISO 27001 framework as well. Uh, that's kind of where I uh, specialize in. I used to be also specialized in system management and virtualization, but it's, it's, a, it's been a journey. So um, my focus is how can organizations and individuals be secure and also um, use the minimum, they've got the basics uh, uh, to make sure that if they've got a good foundation in security. I think uh, basics really matter, that means IT hygiene. Um, we need to really look at um, those basic things to make sure that we, whatever we do, the data we manage, the systems we manage are secure, and then look at other uh, advanced technical solutions. Um, I, I did a um, TEDx talk as well. It's, it's called um, Look at the People Before You uh, Go Hunting for the um, Magic Security Box, because there's no such thing. Thank you. That's really cool, Chani, man. But uh, your work is really amazing. And uh, I, I was, I'm planning to be a consultant too. So that's a good thing. <laughs> yeah. So, uh, so we'll start with the questions. So, one more interesting thing I had the opportunity of to stalk every one of you so that I could direct my questions correctly. <laughs> so I'm going to be using my best knowledge and whatever inputs I've got from every one of you to direct my questions. So the way the panel uh, thing that we have three sections and we go question wise and 
some of the speakers have already uh, marked their questions. So I'll address those questions to those speakers first, and then I'll keep the forum open for if anyone else wants to add it to that. So is that fine? Should we start? OK, that's great. So coming to our first part, the first part says application of machine learning and cyber. So as we all know, like machine learning, artificial intelligence is taking over the world. I don't know if robots will take over us, but yeah, it is certainly taking over business. So the first question in this is, uh, what is the main objective of cybersecurity? And this is for Abbas, sir. <laughs> sure. Thanks, Arya. Yes. So cybersecurity, I mean, this is a, you can say a buzzword. Everybody is using the cybersecurity these days rather than talking about information security, which I believe the cybersecurity is a subset of information security. To go and talk about cybersecurity, first we have to understand where it evolved from. So it started, if I if I take example of my own career, I started as an as an IT admin managing the uh, infrastructures, um, taking care of the novel network and Windows NT, and then 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 a time came that we have to install a firewall and a router so that we have everything protected behind that firewall, and we call it IT security. We never talked about information security at that time. Then after the involvement of BS double five BS double seven double nine, which is now we call it ISO twenty seven thousand one, it created a information security domain, which an encompass of various categories, all the way from human security to data security to application security to physical security, and their objective was any wherever you have the data stored could be uh, on your machine on a server or data could be a spoken or information could be stored in a paper form the whole objective was to secure those information and after the emerge of cloud companies such as microsoft and aws and google and all the SaaS application which we see today uh, mushrooming everywhere you know everything is on application could be on the phone could be a SaaS application hosted on a cloud provider or on a hosting provider there is an emergence of cyber security now and the whole objective of cybersecurity is making sure that you are protected while you are connected. See, if I give a def my own definition of what is cybersecurity, when I've been asked, where, where, where I've given lectures on cybersecurity in a couple of universities, the first thing they ask, what is cybersecurity? So stay protected while connected. I would say that's the definition of cybersecurity. And if you relate back to the objective, we want to make sure that our information and the data is always protected from various cyber threats and cyber attack while we are connected to the internet, which is the best or the most safest information of the data or device, which is not connected to internet and disconnected from everywhere. Then, then we call it a secure one. But as soon as you connect it, then you are exposed to a number of threats and we need to protect that uh, information data or the resources what is uh, on a connected world. So that's the main objective. I would love to hear from other Analyst here, what's their definition and objective of cyber security? I'd like to add something to that. Um, I think for me, it's the safety of people and their data. That is the main objective I see as cyber security. Uh, why it's there? Because it's, it's to protect us. We need to be safe. Our data needs to be safe. Um, and when the data is on systems and computers and networks, uh, they need to be protected in such a way. I think. Um, for me, the main objective of security itself is safety of people and life. All right. That was really cool, uh, Abbas, sir, Chani, ma'am. And uh, Pam, Pamela, ma'am, also wanted to add something on what are the objectives of cybersecurity. Yeah, so let me uh, take your question, which was originally for, I think, on uh, how to protect AI and cybersecurity. But before mm -hmm. we go to that, what are the essential uh, standing points or what makes up the triad of cybersecurity is what is called CIA, as you know, mm -hmm. right? It's confidentiality, yep. integrity, and availability. And the, the salient point, I think, to take away for what is the essence and goal of cybersecurity is that data and information is protected and authorized users view and access the information at a 
for the level they are supposed to be authorized and what is uh, relevant to them, meaning there can be different levels of security, whether it's highly classified, it's um, very sensitive, et cetera. So depending on what that information is and what is the criticality of that information for the, um, for the business, you don't want to have everyone access everything, right? So that's the basic essence of cybersecurity is to protect information and to protect data and the systems that it's stored on and transmits on so that it has a, that authorized, who is authorized to access that information. Uh, another impact, another very important factor is of course uh, integrity, right? So depending on the use case, integrity may be even more important than confidentiality. For example, if you have a financial transaction, uh, you're sending um, money over of the wire, right? You wanna make sure that only uh, the rightful recipient receives the, uh, the data and the, uh, the money, but also that it wasn't uh, altered, that instead of getting $100,000, you get a million dollars, for example. Right, so that, that is extremely important. And um, then of course, availability. Um, why is availability important? I would actually, if we had a live audience, I would be very interested in um, kind of making the audience um, take this as, uh, engage the audience, right? Why would you think uh, availability is the essential component of cybersecurity and information security? So availability, and I'll just answer it because I'm not sure what the interaction with the audience may be. Um, for critical revenue impacting systems, if they, are, if they go offline, it can heavily impact the bottom line for a business. So CIA, this CIA triad for cybersecurity is really goes, uh, is, is very context-based, but really goes, travels as a uh, triangle. Now, next, um, I just want to quickly, because um, this is not a simple or a quick answer as to, you, you were talking about artificial intelligence, right? And how to secure AI, how to secure whatever, uh, by the way, so AI is bandied about as a uh, umbrella term, but it has a lot of different types of technology under AI, right? So you can have machine learning being one, you can have natural language processing, you can have uh, computer vision or robotics or what have you, all right? Each one will have a different cybersecurity component, but one thing that I've been focusing on, and if you uh, are want to connect with me on LinkedIn, because I've heavily post on this topic, which is, what is cybersecurity of AI, but also most importantly, uh, looking at it holistically, what is the trust in AI and what does that entail? Meaning, is it cybersecurity? Is it privacy? Is it transparency? And how does it all come together? Those are really critical, critical topics that we, we really all should be thinking about today, whether we are cybersecurity professionals or in other areas. And I know you had, uh, you know, your audience is uh, maybe not all cybersecurity professionals or wanna, want to be cybersecurity professionals. So I think it's, I'm mentioning it so that it's uh, kind of uh, reaches out to that audience as well. Yeah. But we can come back to this because this is a very, very big topic. And I would like to cover about what is the threat and um, risk and cybersecurity of AI. Uh, that was a very good point, Pamela, ma'am. And what you said is totally right. The audience for this program is going to be mostly undergraduate students, and they may or may not be from the cyber field. So that's why this question was like critical, so that they get an idea of what's going on and like an overall gist. So before we move forward, we have a new member to our party. So welcome, Vandana, ma'am. Uh, hi, we are glad to have you. Just like, uh, don't worry. It's like everyone just gave their a quick introduction. So if you don't mind, could you like? give a quick introduction of yourself. Sure. Uh, thank you so much. And apologies for joining a little late because of for no first the time zone difference. I didn't mm -hmm. realize in those alerts. 
uh, which was not there. So apologies. A little bit about me. I am currently working with Sneak, which is a software security company. And I'm also serving on uh, open source boards. So one of them is OWASP. OWASP is Open Web Application Security Project. That's about me. That that was really nice. Wonder Ma'am, it's like open source is taking like over the world kind of like everyone is switching from proprietary software to open source. So cybersecurity and open source becomes critical because anyone can actually have access to the source code, right? So that's like a fundamental vulnerability built into it. But that was great. So moving on to our next question uh, is, so what is the success rate of AI to detect cyber attacks? So this question is directed towards Dr. Gaurav Gupta because I stopped you and what I learned from it that uh, you talk a lot about like uh, digital forensics and like that's your forte. So I, I planned on directing the question to you if you yeah. don't mind answering the question. Yeah, Thank so, you, you know, uh, we, when we talk about technology, you know, technology is one common theme in development of technology is providing convenience. You know, any technology which is making our life more and more convenient, we are adopting it. And that is the theme of development where AI also fits in because, you know, using artificial intelligence, we can do a lot of things. AI can predict, uh, you know, what we like. AI can then, you know, help us uh, uh, see some uh, uh, markers which can help us do decision making. When we talk about technology, you know, when we are using AI for good, the same thing can be also misused. You know, criminals also use uh, artificial intelligence for doing a lot of, you know, fraudulent activity. And that reminds me, and uh, as I recall, there's a website known as uh, uh, thispersondoesnotexist.com. You know, if you go to that website, there is a engine, AI engine running in the background, which is generating synthetic faces of the people who do not exist on this earth, right? So AI can be misused bo uh, by criminals and it is for betterment also. Now, as we know that, you know, because of the convenience, uh, we at times do not value security often. You know, we want con we want priority of convenience over security. We choose password like ABCD1234 rather than having a complex password, which can give us more security, but it's little difficult to remember. And it hindrance uh, in our, uh, uh, you know, in case of, you know, we want to choose a, a difficult password. And what is now also happening is AI is being used to detect uh, you know, cyber crimes. AI used to detect uh, anything which is going to happen. A uh, lot of traffic analysis, a lot of uh, pattern analysis is happening these days where we can predict, you know, what kind of attack is going to happen where. Uh, a lot of AI is being used in policing today because, you know, police want to find out what are the hotspots where crime can happen, what kind of crimes can happen at what part of the city. So because a lot of data is being generated using CCTV cameras, uh, through, uh, you know, networks, through ISPs, and all this data can not be processed by a person, right? So it needs, we need some kind of artificially intelligent program, which can process this data and can generate red flags for us. So we are using artificial intelligence uh, for doing a lot of attack analysis, and it is quite successful. But then, you know, criminals are also using uh, the same kind of technologies, and at times they are able to leverage technology to do a lot of frauds. So, so it is a cat and mouse race. And, you know, uh, again, you know, that's where I call upon people to invest their time and energy in doing research in this area so that you can develop better and stable solutions, which can be used to now prevent and detect attacks. Thank you, Yoro, sir. That was a really great insight on forensics and like how we can use data to mark red flags so that there is not a person doing all the hard work. So moving to the next question. So this is uh, directed towards Vandana ma'am because I heard from your introduction you deal a lot with open source software. So the question goes like, what do you mean by perimeter based and database protection? And this is essentially directed towards open source software because there is like everyone customizes to its own own needs and there's no like a company managing the code. So how do you think this with along with zero trust works? And what do you any two cents on that? Sure. Uh, when I talk about uh, open source data, specifically, mm -hmm. it actually gets as part of the code when we start embedding the libraries, the third party dependencies from a software security perspective, if I have to say, because uh, as per the stats and even the research reports, which have been uh, done by many companies and uh, open source forums, only 10 to 20% is the code which organizations write. 
and when they only write 10 to 20 percent 80 to 90 percent is all open source now to understand you mentioned that data or parameter it's very vague term to be used here because when they don't know what they are leveraging it'll be very difficult to figure out the vulnerabilities in them a lot of times organizations don't even know what they are using for example log 4 j was one vulnerability which was detected in december it was a huge one any organization that was impacted they actually lost a huge amount of money why first they were not sure whether they are using or not second when they started to get to know they needed resource to fix that they needed to tell customers that they have to fix it and then second case was that there were interdependencies even if your you are not impacted but if you're using any third party vendor which is impacted and then again it impacts you as well so the most important aspect from all of this is or learning from this is that let's start documenting all of these things that we have till the time we don't know how many doors or windows we have in our house how will we protect it from the thieves that's the most important aspect so what open source also tells us that with great power comes great responsibility use it it's amazing i love open source but at the same time let's start documenting it also um, uh, talks about the supply chain security which is uh, which is becoming very very big problem and um, so i just recently attended black hat and i'm still in us and uh, every other vendor was talking about supply chain security or attack surface management now why are they talking about it because that's hot topic but is it new no it has been there for a very very long time and uh, but when solar winds uh, was uh, hit by all of this thing and then microsoft reported it then they realized oh we have to start working organizations start working towards it but that's not new so what are the action items for it is that let's start building a repository data management data asset repository where we know what we have similarly for third party dependencies third party vendors or binaries what we have i think if we know what we have in our house we are half already secured but till the time we don't know we will just keep shooting in the dark right on the man thank you for that it's like uh inventory management is as important as like doing your patching your vulnerabilities right so that was great and the next question that i have is my personal favorite so i'd like to add something to that uh, to what i'm going to answer if i may oh yeah 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 you can enter anyone can interrupt me anytime so that's fine yeah. Yeah. i think we talked about parameter security when it comes to parameter security we have to also consider the fact that the network side you know uh, you know how she talked about having windows and doors open. Uh, that's in the physical world, and it would have class to businesses as well. So you have to look at your perimeter bounding um, uh, around you know, what kind of locks and doors and things you have in there, uh, the premise to protect yourself. But also in the network side of things, we are all connecting to the internet to get out to wherever we want to do our job, right? So, for example, if you're working from home. You first connect into your router um, and you see uh, a part of the computer to access the world wide web. And that's from where you enter into the other side of uh, So that's your perimeter boundary when it comes to data networks. So you need to make sure that that router is protected and then the bank of file will configure correctly. So, and if it's any network, you have to make sure your boundary firewalls are protected. And yes, data um, is important. If you have firewalls open, ports open, uh, letting people come in and do whatever you want or send data out to anywhere, anywhere um, then it's, it's your boundary is not protected. So like your physical boundary, you need to think about your logical or the, the data boundaries as well, uh, where your firewalls are located and segmenting uh, certain areas where uh, if you need, say for example, a secure uh, network. So you need to make sure how you design your networks as well. So this is very high. I'm addressing here because 
But I think it's really important that uh, if you're going into cyber security, that you understand how computers work, how networks work, and now cloud systems as well. Uh, so it's it's a really um, it's a very foundational. But you need to know where your data travels, how your data travels, where it's stored, who's accessing the data. All these things are really important to know how you protect these systems. Uh, if you don't understand your architecture or the map of your house, uh, you don't know where to go, right? So, and what to protect. So it, it's, it's like that in the data world as well. You need to know how your data flows, where your systems are, um, um, who's accessing these things, um, who has access to these things, who can modify these things, um, to make sure that you have the right controls in place in each level to protect the assets you have. Thank you. <laughs> and if I can just add to that, uh, Arya. Yeah. Um, so, Achani, I think that's a great point, and uh, also Vandana, I think, to us before. Um, I, I do believe uh, I do agree with both of you, uh, and I think at the end of the day, for an organization, it's that asset inventory is not just internal; is really important to understand for uh, anyone. That when you asset inventory is absolutely critical. Data asset, data is an asset. And that inventory of where is your critical data, where is your public data, having that heat map of the organization is really critical. But knowing that that perimeter is not a solid perimeter anymore, so meaning your assets can be residing on your business partner's um, site. So it can be hosted. Everybody is moving to the cloud or has moved to the cloud. So this is not a not a perimeter uh, perimeter absolutely actually would not doesn't even really um, hold anymore you know it's, um, it's just so porous and it's so it's like a wave right it's just going everywhere so having that in inventory and uh, understanding of what your business is doing how it's hosting this data where it's storing its data who is it sharing with all that is really important. So if we can, if we want to take a look at the technical level, what is the, uh, you know, what you're talking about from the OASP side, you know, which I am a very, very big fan of because I think OASP has done a phenomenal job in identifying what are the coding issues that can be, that can play a critical role when you develop applications that are facing the internet, for example, or facing the outside world, in this case, maybe even partners, okay? So I'll give you an example um, of where you, you want to leverage what OASP has and then think outside to where does that go uh, when it comes to facing the outside world? For example, uh, watering hole uh, attacks, you may have heard of those, right? Where it's, you have a, if you take the GitHubs of the world and you poison where the developers are going to get libraries or frameworks, etc., then in essence, you have tainted the pond, right? You have in, in, um, inserted yourself into that development cycle, even though you're, you may be following all the best security development practices, okay, for coding. And this is just for code development. So we're not even talking about now at a data level, right? Which is at a higher level. But even for development, the, the problem is secure, cybersecurity is, you know, I was talking about the CIA triad, which is the, what is the uh, end purpose of cybersecurity? But then if we look at what comprises cybersecurity, there are, uh, has anyone um, taken the CISSP um, certification? Okay, great. So the you, as you know, there are 14 areas, 14 full domains, or 10 domains in CISSP, 14 in ISO 27001. There are disparate, I would say, levels and areas of cybersecurity, which may not even um, completely overlap or have a, a you know, re relation to the other. That can become and uh, a very big concern for a company. So for example, network security, as Shani mentioned, coding, as Vandana mentioned, right? Those are two areas, two domains. And then there is 
uh, compliance, there is regulations, right? There is um, HR, there is your, you know, your hiring and your security organization, really. Uh, who's in charge of security? So all that does play a very big part in how do you address security, okay? Last but not least, though, most organizations don't have unlimited budget, right? That is where the practical uh, side comes in, right? Everybody does not have an unlimited budget. So how are you going to look at three out of these three areas, forget about all looking at it very holistically and comprehensively? I would say the biggest challenge today is the cybersecurity surface, a threat surface can be very large, but the budget is very small for organizations. Skill set is very small. So if your audience is looking to go into cybersecurity, this is absolutely a critical field. And we all, even if go into other fields, do what Aria is doing, which is take it as a minor because we desperately need the skill set. It's a complex area. I'll stop there for now. Right, from Alam. You are very right about the business aspect as well as highlighting how the boundaries, the question was framed in a way that perimeters, since they are no longer limited to one server room or like a couple of server rooms somewhere in the building, everything is like spread out across. What is cloud? Cloud is a collection of servers spread over the world. How do you maintain them securely? Because if someone can just plug in their laptop somewhere, it is still a vulnerability, right? So as you rightly said, perimeter is very porous. And as Chani Ma'am also rightly highlight that you need to know if you want to get into cybersecurity, you need to have fundamental knowledge of OS level components, as well as the command line interface and what ports are important and how they should be access control basically. So that is one of uh, interview questions. Don't ask me how I know that, but yeah. <laughs> yeah, that is one of the important things that people if who want to get into cybersecurity should focus on. So this is our last question for this section. And this is a fun one. Uh, so this is directed towards Abbasar. What does the term shoulder surfing mean? <laughs> well, the answer is within the term itself, right? Shoulder surfing is somebody peeping against you while you're typing something, right? And we, we have seen uh, shoulder surfing in the physical world as well. Somebody is piggybacking you while you're trying to enter into a, a, a typical parameter. So we call it tailgating, but one of the form of shoulder surfing. But literally the term means uh, you are working in a, in a shared space, could be in a, in a cafe or in a coffee shop or even in your office and somebody just passing by and watching while you're typing the username and password or your keyboard and trying to guess your password from that what you're doing is. Or, or you're doing some uh, sensitive work and somebody is watching you from the back uh, while uh, the activities were done. So in literal word, somebody is peeping you, a peeping Tom, <laughs> in, yeah. as we call it. Uh, exactly. It's uh, the surfing method. Yeah. yeah. Just to so add here, uh, yeah. you know, there is a recent research work where, you know, let's say like we are in a Zoom meeting now and let's say if somebody is parallelly working on their other browser, let's say logged in in a Gmail or banking, doing banking transaction, using artificially intelligent program i can have the recorded video of each one of you given to this program and it can predict and find out what were you doing let's say if you are logging into gmail what were your username and password based on the mm -hmm. movement of your eyelids and the shoulder movement and the upper body movement mm -hmm. so so this is a extremely new form of uh, you know shoulder surfing where i'm leveraging technology in the modern world yeah right. you can leverage even the malware malware for that uh, there is a concept called uh, drive by download kind of a mechanism so when you're visiting certain website it downloads a code on your laptop and captures every keystroke what you're doing it so there are yeah. many many other areas shoulder surfing can be expanded if at all you right. want it. yeah this is one of the interesting things like keystrokes as you <laughs> said so this can be done in a computer but what people used to do in like atms when you use a keys you leave a heat stroke on the key so yeah. there are some powders or some thermal cameras which can tell you what keys were pressed and someone can guess your pin. It's like four digits. You're so watching that's like shoulder surfing. Yeah. 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 <laughs> <laughs> shoulder surfing is like uh, something that each one of us can try to avoid. And like basically that's one of the social constructs of cybersecurity, which should be addressed sure. as well. Arya, I want to add so, something to it. Yeah, Vandana. Totally. So shoulder surfing is something, how much ever we try, you can never avoid every yeah. 15 days 
I have to change my passport. Mm -hmm. My kid is not even seven years old. I had no idea how he pips into my phone. I have um, facial recognition. Still, sometimes when it doesn't work properly, then mm -hmm. I have to type in password, like passcode. Right. It's an eight digit passcode and I still have to change because right. the kid actually guess it the way I move my fingers or something. So that's classic <laughs> case and it's just mm -hmm. home. So mm -hmm. th these things, how much ever we try, we cannot avoid. Just take precautions. That's it. Yeah. And key yeah. loggers are something which actually we can avoid by making sure, um, as Sir mentioned, the code gets downloaded or uh, maybe when so the first key log thing, key logger thing happened with me when we were using hardware key loggers, which are not very prominent now. But just be aware about uh, those software key loggers, which generally come via email or uh, uh, when we go to any website, which gets downloaded. So probably we need to be very cautious about those e uh, phishing emails. Generally, this is what prominent is these days for key logging. But right, shortlist logging right. is something can happen in airports, can happen in uh, buses, taxis, or anywhere. Right, right. You're totally right, ma'am. If if you're saying that you can kid can uh, guess your passcode, then surely someone who's like trained can very easily guess someone's passcode. That's pretty cool. But so since you all are leaders in cybersecurity in each of your individual spaces, I have a question because this was one of our projects at Penn State. How do you increase awareness about shoulder surfing and tell people to be careful? I think the best thing to do is show an example, right? And awareness, security awareness and training is mm -hmm. is is uh, all going to be on top of that, on telling what are, how it can happen and what is going to happen. But uh, actually, one thing I would do want to mention is, <laughs> Gaurav, I think I should stop going on uh, LinkedIn while I'm on the, <laughs> on the panel, so because you're talking about reading the uh, eye movement and uh, looking at... <laughs> what a person is doing and this actually happened to me i was interviewing somebody for a privacy session the other day mm -hmm. for um i may have mentioned that i'm uh, i have a series on linkedin running on the essential pillars of trustworthy ai and privacy is one of them and i was interviewing someone and i could actually see in her glasses what she was looking at uh because this was over a zoom call so i don't know <laughs> Yeah, so it's it's happening. Um, it's trying to sort of sort of yeah. guess. <laughs> <laughs> That's really funny. It's it's, like, it's one of my favorite questions because it like makes everyone laugh basically. <laughs> but moving on, thank you for saying that. Uh, like it, it can happen in coffee shops and especially with like the rise of remote work. Pamela, ma'am, thank you for giving me the subject so that we can pivot to our second part, which is latest cyber crimes around the world. So. This question wow. is, yep. I, so, I definitely am interested in answering that one. <laughs> so I'll direct this one to you since you volunteered to answer it. It says, uh, what do you think that workplaces, like work laptops and everything, they have VPNs and stuff, but even especially after COVID when everyone is working from a very random point in a place and you no longer have like physical aspect of security, what is yeah. something the two two parts? What is uh, one thing the employee should do, and secondly, what is the employer should do to so, make it a secure experience? Sorry. Okay, uh, um, absolutely. So you know, I when COVID uh, the pandemic broke out, I was actually leading a task force for NIST. Uh, I don't know if you're familiar with that. It's a um, NIST is a National Institute of Standards and Technology Sorry. in the U.S. And you know, there are a lot of standards that. Uh, this publishes. When the pandemic broke out, uh, the FBI actually was warning of the other coronavirus, which is the online, uh, the, the uh, viruses that are being unleashed, that were unleashed, I should say now in the past, uh, when it started. Because what did COVID do? COVID-19, uh, the pandemic, helped reduce the, the largest global remote workforce globally right mm -hmm. so i don't know which part i've said already it's kind of late in the night but let me just stress it again the largest global remote workforce okay ever and nobody was prepared for it 
So it did pose some unique challenges for employers and employees. But let's just talk about employers because <clears throat> uh, I think employees is on a personal level and it kind of will have a trickle effect, right? So for the employers, right, the biggest issue was, um, well, let me introduce IoT into this topic, into this conversation now. Because you may have VPNs, as you said, Arya. You may have a secure way of connecting to the workplace. However, if you are having a conversation in your family room and there is a voice activated uh, device, whether it's Alexa or Google, I don't care which company it may be, so it's not directed at a particular um, uh, you know, company, okay? But if you have these devices and you're talking about which are you know always listen more, all right? So now if you're talking in that environment and you are uh, talking about um, things that are highly sensitive for a business, then that's one thing that can be a problem. But that's not the only thing, right? If you're printing information on an in unsecure network and that is part of, um, sensitive, that can be a problem, right? Not prepared for that even now, okay? And last but not least, for highly regulated industries, such as FEHPA, for example, for healthcare in the US, if you are talking, you know, where you have the, um, the uh, expectation and requirement that you to preserve privacy of the information of the, of the person that you are, uh, your patient, if you're discussing that in your kitchen and there are people who are obviously not uh, authorized to hear that information, then that poses a threat for and a problem for the employers. Okay, so so all these are, I would say, a byproduct of um, not being prepared for having that remote workforce. Okay, and on the personal side, there is no risk that is coming from the company to the individual. But I think most any and all of these are also applicable on the personal side of the house, right? Because everybody is working from home, the the target now is not just a company network. Because if you target a individual and their wireless connection and check for a, a home connection, a home router which may not be configured mm -hmm. in a secure fashion, then that is going to be opening up a risk for and a, a huge risk, security risk for the individual and trickle upwards into the uh, organization. So it goes both ways. Yeah. Right. Uh, right. I Thank would you. like to share a personal yes, story. Not a, not a personal story, but the real story, uh, mm -hmm. what happened during COVID-19. Uh, as Pamela, Madam said that, yeah, entire world has become all of a sudden a remote worker or a work from home employee. Now, what happened is uh, lots of Asian countries, including India, it was not well prepared and they still don't provide, I don't, not I would say they still don't, but most of the company do not provide the laptop for their employee. They are expected they will come to office, use the desktop and work. Now, all of a sudden, they have to work from home. Imagine a family of five or, or six people, including kids and all, and including if husband and wife, both are working. They have one device including the kids who is also supposed to do the homeschooling. So one device is used by two family members or all the family members for doing either schooling or doing sharing the workload of that. And the company, the, especially the challenge which was faced by companies, they, don't, they can't place an order for the new hardware or a new laptop for their employee. So what they did is they started, uh, uh, went to market and started buying a refurbished and a secondhand laptop, which was not a approved vendor or approved hardware. With, with the old uh, all uh, systems and uh, hardware configuration without uh, security chipset on them and now these devices become more uh, become vulnerable and created a huge challenge for the CIOs and a CISO who is managing the security now they have a challenge of managing the old unsupported hardware the IT team is working day and night to support them with all the application which can run on that hardware second they have a challenge that the home network which traditionally is not supposed to be as secure as a corporate network, as Pamela Adam said, right? They have they have a challenge on questions like, is the home network secure and the devices which have been used by employees is, is, is good enough or not? Third, the amount of information on the data which has been downloaded on the device. Now the challenge is who is accessing it? Of course, they have a login ID and they know that somebody is using them, but is it their kids who is using it or is the partner or a wife or a husband who is using that device? 
and there could be a, a challenge of they are looking at the data and maybe by mistake sharing or deleting the data as well. So there were a number of challenges which CIOs and CISO faced and started the approach they started doing is heighten the security alert, looking at every piece of data and a log which they can capture, enforcing second factor authentication so they know that person who has a second factor authentication is able to log in on that, and bringing the security more closure to the data itself. So rather than having a firewall in their network to protect the data, they want to bring the security to the device or the data where it resides. So the security should be within that hardware layer or the data layer, encryption of the data, classification of the automatic of, of the data, you know, rights management. These are the concept which emerge and people have started moving towards so they can protect that uh, remote workforce which is working from home. Right, right. Abbas, thank you so much for taking that up. My next question was this. And Sorry, it was I, to be I'd like to add something to that as well. I think yeah. this is an important topic because, um, you know, this has happened in many countries. End user devices are one of the most vulnerable things that are in our networks right now. Uh, some companies, you know, use um, people the board in their own device. Approach. Um, so I think we use it to do their own device to work, do the business. And they don't do the um, risk assessment enough to kind of understand what kind of risk they're bringing in with that device. You know, it's, I call it the bring your own disaster uh, because it, it, it can cause um, massive problems. And um, there's five things that I look at when it comes to managing and using devices. Um, so that that involves your boundary firewalls. That could be your internet uh, router. You know, as you can do it properly, and then your device firewall. Do you have a device firewall? If, you know, if you, for example, if you're using Windows, there's Windows Defender, for example, protected. Um, then the access controls. One of the main things I see all the time is that, especially this is uh, developers are um, uh, quite. Um, I've seen it often with developers, but normal people as well. When they're using their laptops, you can configure your laptop to give different rights to different accounts. So, for example, standard user account, um, and then your administrator account, which has the gold rights, right? So, if people are working, uh, browsing the internet, uh, you know, checking emails and day-to-day -day activities on an uh, admin user account, you must all check your systems and find out what system are you running on. Is it the standard user, which has less privileges, or is it the admin account that you're running to do your day-to-day -day activities? If you are, that means um, every site you visit or every attachment you open, you're giving broad rights to that uh, application or, or, or malware or whatever that comes through you know, because you're running as admin. Now, that control itself, if you configure your system to run as a standard user to do your day to day activities, that could stop quite a lot of um, viruses and malicious activities that could happen in your uh, laptop because you're not giving uh, enough rights for that software to be executed. But if you're running as an administrative user, you're giving board rights to that program to run and do whatever it likes. So that is a very crucial uh, control that one must look at when configuring your device for work or even personal stuff because that could set a lot of um, security vulnerabilities. The next one is your patching. Is your device patched properly? What I mean by patch is the software updates. You know, if you're running software that is uh, out of support or um, uh, uh, or even uh, uh, you know, pirate software, which is a common thing in, in the Asian countries where you would go and buy this pirate software to install on your laptop because the real software is quite expensive. But if you're running these things, um, then it, it's you know it's cheap for a reason, right? What does it come with? Um, and, and your main operating system, is it up to date? So those things you need to look at. If you're running one of a code on your laptop, that's another vulnerability. Um, that you're being exposed to, it, it, you know. Uh, then your malware protection. How are you, you know, protecting your laptop uh, from different malware or any uh, other malicious code? Uh, so those things you, you must. These are like very basic things that we can consider uh, looking into improving. 
and that could stop a attack. Ransomware is, is, is something that uh, spreads easily and, and it's very common and one of the main things and it comes through phishing attacks and, and uh, scams and things like that. So you, let's say you get a um, um, phishing email with an attachment on and you click on it thinking, okay, this is someone I know who's sending this and it's, it, it's not the person you thought it was. You click on the link or the attachment and then bang. Mm -hmm. But if you're if you're running as a standard administrator, uh, sorry, standard user, not as an administrative user, that malware can't uh, run as uh, it likes it to. Be. You know, it's, it has it's, it's got only very limited privileges, so that stop that attack, right? And and then all of this plus your backups. So if you're keeping backups, um, mm -hmm. then you could restore your laptops. Or you restore your data. That is another way to protect yourself from ransomware. Uh, so there's a lot of basic things that you can look into protecting yourself uh, from these malicious attacks, and people don't follow that, and businesses don't follow that. So it has to start from the individual level, and then going into your business as well. So that that those are really very basic things, but very important things. Right, Shanima. You're very right about talking about end user security and device security. And with COVID, when everyone's using their personal laptop, and as Abasa said, when the company doesn't give them work laptops, they're totally dependent on like the customer, consumer great security of the laptops. So just a quick question before we uh, move to the next one is uh, like a follow up to this. There is something called Microsoft Authenticator, right? So is that a step towards promoting security on like personal devices which are not work devices but like personal devices with consumer grade protection so two cents on that abasa so irrespective of authenticator right could be google authenticator could be microsoft authenticator i'm not yeah. trying to advocate microsoft product here but the fundamental here is either going a sec having a second factor authentication for your password or going completely passwordless what do I mean by passwordless? In which you will not have to remember your password at all. So you create your password once, which is alphanumeric and eight to 10 characters. But every time you want to log in, you will use a biometric on your hardware device if it is supported with a, with a, a latest TPM chipset, chipset. Either you can have a fingerprint or a camera. Windows Hello is one of the example for logging into your operating system. Secondly, you're having a single sign-on uh, authentication or any of the application within the company you're trying to access, it is not going to prompt you a password. It will prompt a code on the screen which you need to match with your authenticator app, which is Microsoft Authenticator app. Once you match it, you log in. So there is no usage of password <clears throat> at all. And everything what Chani explained before can be subsided into a, something called a zero trust architecture okay. framework. Right, mm -hmm. all the concept and the principles and and uh, and the fundamental which which she talked about, which is a list privilege, you know, uh, assume breach mindset and uh, always trust, never verify, which is a concept of authenticator uh, in this particular case. That you create a conditional access in your environment only mm -hmm. when the risk of a, of an of an identity could be a human identity, could be a machine identity, could be an application identity. When the risk is changed. Only at that point of time, you uh, you uh, prompt a second factor authentication or a second challenging factor for logging into that device. Otherwise, you don't need to prompt the end user every time they're trying to log in. So these are the things we need to focus on uh, when you're creating a, a conditional based authentication framework, if I may call it. Right, right. It was, it was something that I interacted with and I found it like amusing when it like in, in, installed all the profiles on my phone. I'm like, why does it need to do all that? But it mm -hmm. makes sense a lot more sense now. So for the final question in our cyber crimes around the world section, I would like to ask Dr. Gaurav sir if you would like to take this question. This is two months of 2022 saw more cyber crimes than in entire 2018. Why is e-fraud a ticking time bomb? And another uh, appendix to this question would be how do we work with blockchain to promote non-repudiation? Okay. So, you know, uh, as technology is becoming mainstream and, you know, we are totally dependent on doing all the activities in some way or other on technology, more crimes are going to happen. Uh, more people are trying to do frauds. One reason is that, you know, humans 
have a basic nature of trusting right so we, by default we start with trust or, or even though we know that you know technology as in every phase people might be doing crime people might be exploiting but you know you know we let our guard down so humans have emotion if we all were robots you know cyber crime would have been uh, you know much lesser because we are not robots and we are humans and we have emotions emotions like trust emotions like greed you know somebody sends me a, a lucrative deal and you know some people get excited right somebody tells you that your account is going to be blocked if you don't do this if you don't uh, submit this data you know your card will be blocked or your sim will be blocked so they they do they experience the emotion of panic so we have a lot of you know we have disruption we have fear of missing out so all these emotions which humans have are being exploited by cyber criminals they 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 are direct their attack they they make their trap and develop a story where they exploit these emotions and you know if they send out these kind of traps to 100 million people uh, across world and you know india being the largest of population and you know most people are using technology today where they might not be even aware at times you know what kind of frauds are happening they fall for them you know if out of 1 million people you know 10 10 click on a link you know uh, it's a very uh, huge amount of money for the cyber criminal so criminals for criminals it has become low risk high gain method they only need a laptop a telephone connection and an internet to do crime they don't need anything expensive and they can reach out to anybody across world right so investigation is also very very difficult so these are some of the reasons that you know it's a low investment uh, low risk high gain method and you can reach out to anybody across world uh, and so world is the playground for criminals laws are weak investigation takes a lot of time evidences are fragile you know digital data can be changed in minutes so so all these factors makes it very lucrative for criminals to do crime and on the other hand law enforcement agencies and you know investigators and prosecutors number of trained people are less we need a lot many people uh, who are on to the right side of the law because on the wrong side of the law the population is huge i think that is something uh, so this this uh, mismatch this this balance of you know trained resources on to the right side of the law versus you know anybody who is having a mobile phone and a laptop uh, and intend to do a crime there is a quite a big mismatch and that's actually an opportunity you know as i uh, i know that you know undergraduate students are listening to us so so my request would be that you know you uh, if you are on to the right side of the law if you develop your skills in terms of making sure technology is used only for the betterment if uh, and you develop solutions towards that and if you learn the skills and then you join the workforce of cyber lawyers and investigators you know it is both respect and money for you otherwise on to the other side we criminals may make money but there is no respect and one fine day they will see the uh, you know investigation will happen and law will catch up to them right so they always remain in fear but that is the ground reality that today they are doing more crimes because of these reasons right that was really encouraging for our audience sir, because people are more interested as i said earlier people are more interested in red teaming than actually blue teaming and like blue teaming is what the world actually needs we need we need to be safe we don't want to be feel unsafe and have like 10000 security measures like three factor authentication and something like that that just makes things inconvenient for everyone so just I, I, uh, we will not have job not... in the right people <laughs> You yeah, are I think you need to add that. Well. <laughs> Red team is important because I think doesn't mean it's always bad, right? Mm-hmm. So you know, if you don't have a red team who's trying to be like the criminal, how would yeah. you understand the criminal? It's it's a really important element. But the real criminals are the baddies, uh, not the red teams. I think. Exactly. Um, a... Sorry, go. Yeah, it's like I'm so sorry to interrupt you. I was just saying that uh, I have. I've, seen this in a lot of my peers that no one wants like people are not much attracted towards being on the blue team or i don't want to start the war against both of them but people are not like into it because it's it's kind of boring i would say but it is very interesting once you get into it and red team is of course essential to do all the penetration testing yeah. and like testing if it really works whatever blue team is doing so they are like codependent but yeah I, I, so a quick yeah. So I'd like to ask the audience. Go ahead, go ahead, go ahead. Um, I, I, you said that this audience is very um, they they're not cyber savvy or they're very uh, not technical, right? Oh, um, just oh. wanted to kind of engage the audience a bit more, and I want to ask how many of you still use um, just a password to log into your accounts, cloud accounts, your any accounts, 
and 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 not with two factor as well um, or how many of you use two factor in your day to day activities can you just interact on them um, just say thumbs up or uh, yes we do two factor authentication i mean that's a that's yes. one thing Quite that you can do right now if you want to think about security and if you're really interested in security you need to make sure your data is protected so i'd like to see from the audience like how many of you actually use two factor for your social media accounts, your cloud accounts, and and um, not just the password? Oh, yeah. Everyone is only second factor authentication. All yeah. the bank for all the key applications, period. <laughs> yeah. Right. And if, if you're using just a character password or six character passwords, they can be cracked in that two seconds in the less. Mm -hmm. Now, so you, you should really, if you want to change one thing today, from this session, uh, take away, um, activate your two-factor on all your social media, to your cloud account, to any, any, anything that you, you use on, online. Right, right. I want to add something to it when it's about passwords. Yep. It's my favorite anecdote. Passwords are like toothbrushes. Yeah. If we share our toothbrush with <coughs> anyone, we don't. <laughs> So treat them like toothbrushes and always be use a cap. Like at least I try and use a cap so that it's secure. Similarly, mm -hmm. multi-factor authentication is the same. When you have a strong password and you're telling the whole world that this is my password, it's not going to work out. So you have to use multi-factor authentication so that it's secure. And right. uh, we always have a habit of uh, uh, just telling our partners, telling our friends or best friend. When you can't secure yourself, how can you expect other to secure things for you? I'll give you a funny example, and that's a very recent one. At Black Hat, there was one vendor. I still have the picture of that, which had a password written on a sticky note on the laptop. How you oh. are at a security conference and you're doing that. That's the most strangest thing that I've seen. Like out of all of these in the past three years, two and a half years, we've learned so much to protect ourselves. And you're just going this. Uh, so probably I would say that the basic security hygiene is the first thing that we all need to learn before moving ahead with other things. Right. And the small things actually lead to the big breaches that are happening around. Right, right. Vandaram. You're, you're very right in seeing that like charity begins at home. And with the toothbrush example, it was funny too. So <laughs> pivoting to our last but not the least final part, it is career in different domains of cybersecurity. So this is a hot topic because... Oh, okay. This is cybersecurity. What do we undergrads do with it? So I would like a, a blanket question to everyone. Uh, why do you all think one should choose cybersecurity to build their careers? Just so that our audience can have a hindsight before they make their decision, what they want to do okay. once they graduate. So cybersecurity is an area, you know, where you have less number of people competing against you. You probably get, you know, 2x or 3x salaries if, if you are good at it. So these are some of the very easy reasons, right? Because, you know, there is a demand supply gap, uh, which we all know. Uh, and uh, even though we have supply, uh, you know, having the person who are who is good at it, who wants to learn constantly because you need to constantly upgrade. So if yeah. you have that zeal, you know, you will definitely make more money and you will have very challenging, very interesting, uh, you know, uh, uh, things coming uh, at you. Uh, so it will be very satisfying also to probably solve those challenging questions and, you know, handling situations. And uh, as I told, you know, number of people are very, very less. That's my two cents. Mm -hmm. That's really cool, Gaurav, sir. Demand supply gap is a very important advantage that one has in any field. But another, yeah. another reason, just one Abbas, reason, sir. I mean, I can go on whole day on this topic is <laughs> cybersecurity is impacting everyone's life today irrespective of which industry you are you are in medical field engineering field working from home small business to large business to individual it impacts everyone so cyber security should be part of even the, at a school going kid you start the cyber security education at that level and by the time you are at, at the age of getting into university irrespective of which curriculum you study you have to have a cybersecurity awareness or a, a module in your in your degree, irrespective of what field you are you are studying. And as uh, uh, Dr. Gaurav said, there is a huge demand. Only in Singapore, if I talk about, because I live in Australia, 
I, I covered Singapore and in Singapore itself, there is a 26,000 people in re, in demand in cybersecurity by 2025. That many jobs are open. We need that much people. So it doesn't matter what you study in your undergraduate. Maybe you're studying psychology. You still have a space in cybersecurity world because we are trying to protect the human. And if you are from cybersecurity background, you you are the right person to go and educate and bring more awareness to within your within your industry within your organization to connect with the human brain and allow them to understand the whole concept in in a different way, right? So everyone have a job potential in that. Abbasar, just a follow up question to that. Uh, this was a question listed. It says, what do you think uh, is learning cybersecurity as a degree a good option or one should choose focus on learning on overall computer science syllabus and then specializing in cybersecurity? Because a lot of people get into like IT and CS because they're like hot and then everyone yeah. wants to get into FANG. So how does cybersecurity fit into this whole, what do you say, a notion about so I, will, I will give you my individual opinion on that, right? Because there are I'm sure each one of the panelists will have a different uh, answer on that. But if I yeah. if I tell you, cybersecurity is very interchangeable skill set. If you are doing the computer science and you are focusing on software development, you can easily move in, move into a different a different area within cybersecurity. You can become a system engineer. You can become a system a cloud architect. You can get into secure coding. You can become a pen tester. So having a good foundation level of of uh, IT or cybersecurity is good enough then you focus on based on where you end up with the first job because that's really important you cannot come out from a university and say that i only work want to work in cyber uh, in uh, software engineering because this is what i have spent three years take any job get into the industry and then find your niche whether oh i think i love, love this part rather than doing a software programming i think i i, I love uh, cracking the code and want to try application security and want to learn OWSP and get into web application hacking. Maybe you want to build your career in that and then you can change it. So I would say it's very interchangeable irrespective of what you study uh, in, in your uh, graduation degree. Right, right, Abbas. Uh, skills that you learn in cybersecurity are very transferable. You can just use them anywhere you go in your career. You don't have to pigeonhole yourself to cybersecurity. So I remember Pamela Mam was talking about that, that you should uh cyber security as a career and how should you do so Pamela, would you like to add something to this yeah i think look there are two ways you can approach it if you are interested in cyber security the way i uh, I'll, i can maybe talk about my journey and uh, i've been in the cyber security area for over 20 years and i started out as a programmer actually i created a expert system for designing smart homes for uh, electrical wiring in smart homes okay but i was a programmer and went into email architecture and then security architecture and security um, engineering all right and that has helped me to this date okay having that low level uh, knowledge of bits and bytes and how tcp ip works and how um you know linux administration works and what do you how do you close ports and what are the services are it really is not going to uh, go waste, okay? So I think having a technical base is really important for cybersecurity if you are interested in staying in that field. Even if you're not, it would still become very, very um, handy, you know, but you don't have to be technical for all areas of cybersecurity because there are others which are not very technical, okay? so. Um, what I have been focused on for the last four years is a uh, cybersecurity for artificial intelligence. And in that, two things of really that might be of very uh, high interest, okay. It's not just how to use AI systems for cybersecurity uh, challenges, such as pattern recognition of intrusion detection, for example, on a network, okay. It is also how to build these systems securely. That whole SDLC for AI systems is a huge, huge challenge right now. Okay, and there is more to it than just security. As you know, if you take the Microsoft SDLC process, which I really am a huge proponent of, by the way, and I see uh, Abbas. I think uh, you're from uh, Microsoft. Um, huge proponent of that, but that's not something you can just slap on to an AI ML uh, development cycle, for example. Okay. So the point being, 
you could have a different mindset. You may not be interested in, you know, how to shut down services or do network security, but that's not the only part of cybersecurity. So again, I would go back to it. There are 10 very uh, distinct areas in cybersecurity. I highly encourage you to take a look at what is ISO 27001 and what are uh, what is a CISSP certification, what does that involve? And that's enough to give you an idea of, hey, you know, <clears throat> out of these 10, um, these three really appeal to me. And it doesn't have to be technical or it doesn't have to be all legal and governance and, you know, uh, policy based. Okay. So the short answer is there is more to cybersecurity than tech, uh, technical um, uh, expertise. And, but if technical expertise is what you are, you know, excited by, then you there is that as well so there is um there are multiple areas in cybersecurity and it's certainly worth taking a look at in depth and ha happy to reach out i mean uh, feel free to reach out to me i'm happy to help uh, if you have any questions because i too actually uh, you're mentioning psychology i did start out uh, my undergrad is in psychology and the reason i got into uh computers actually was because i uh could not do clinical. It was just too much for me to handle. So I said, okay, what's next best to psychology? That'll be artificial intelligence. And that's how I ended up in right. uh, cybersecurity and artificial intelligence. So. Right, Pamela Ma'am. As, as Pamela Ma'am is an example for you that you don't need to have a technical major. And I've seen a lot of people from psychology in cybersecurity because and going back to shoulder surfing, shoulder surfing is a psychological problem, not a technical one. And there was this one, my one of my favorite professors who used to say that Technical problems are usually just the 10% of the puzzle. People problems form up the less 90%. So on that note, uh, this is one of the questions which is like highly asked. It's my personal opinion that two of the industries in which certifications matter a lot is firstly cloud and secondly, cybersecurity. So is there a starting point like from where a person who has beginner knowledge or no knowledge of cybersecurity to start and get a certification so that he can have that on the resume and apply to jobs. I'll Open just question. answer that really quick, um, uh, Arya, because yeah, uh, I started out with ISC uh, Square. You know, I founded a chapter mm -hmm. of that in Connecticut also, because I do believe that they have a good approach. CISSP is a gold standard globally, and it is definitely worth the 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 pain I would say to get it because it is a it's it's not an easy uh, certification to get but it's really worth it. And there is nothing that speaks higher uh, of than on the resume or than having a CISSP. I have a CISSP and a CISM, which is issued by ISACA, and which is more for security management. And I also have a CISSLP, which is for secure development of applications. But I would say, uh, and there are a gazillion more I know on the technical side, but I think, uh, and cloud security, for example, yeah, <coughs> CISSP would get my vote. <laughs> yep, I, I agree totally. CISSP is like the gold standard, as ma'am rightly said. And along with that, cloud certifications become specific to the platform, let's say AWS, Azure, or GCP. So that is a subjective thing. But CISSP is like everyone knows if you have a CISSP, they assume that you have some kind of knowledge in the cyberspace. I'd like to add a um contradictory comment to that actually. Yeah, 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 yeah. Um, yeah I'm not a believer in gathering certifications. It's good. But um, there are a lot of training out there which is not inclusive when it comes to different types of people, especially neurodiverse communities. Um, and and certain certifications just a vocabulary of words. Um, you know, so it doesn't mean that you are a good professional uh, or a cyber security professional just because you have these certifications. So I, I think um, if you want to get into cyber security and are interested, really looking deep inside as to what you want, is it something that you are passionate in? You know, if you value trust, integrity, if you, if you want to be secure, that's something that you really need to ask, uh, the questions that you need to ask yourself. And you don't need to go and do a degree in cyber security or, or, or a, a, a certain certification just to be a cyber security professional in the industry. There's a lot of 
free resources out there to start learning from. YouTube, for example, right? So there's free resources. You need to first look at what you know what cybersecurity is. Understand is it something that you want to uh, you know uh, know about? Ask yourself: Do you want to protect yourself first? You know that's really important. Things have to start at home. And, and then when you're going into gathering certification, don't be a person who collects certification. That's not going to get you a job or be good at your job. You need to get experience. Experience are valued more than your certification stuff. So, or, or degree, because I, when I first did my degree in computer science, I thought, oh, great, you know, I could, I could do everything now. I, I got a computer science degree. But you know, when you go into your job, that doesn't really, um, you know, <laughs> really apply to what you studied in your degree. So it's, it's completely different. You know, my manager first asked me to go and build a, a, a server and a rack. Did I, uh, did I learn that in my degree? <laughs> no. <laughs> so I had to learn from scratch. And then it's same that um, in, in cybersecurity. Um, I had to go and perform an audit. Um, yeah. Did my CISSP training help? It helped me to understand the words and vocabulary and terms and things, but mm -hmm. did it teach me how to conduct a risk assessment uh, for a company and how to design a, a, a framework to some extent, but not. So the practicality of things is really important. You know, actually doing the job is really yeah. important. So when you're starting out, do this training, which is great. They all help. All these different training courses from different companies help, uh, but don't think that the certification is going to get you the right job or the right experience or make you a good security professional. Uh, right. That's what I believe in. So you need to kind of have that balance of yes, getting the knowledge and the education, but also actually doing the work to gain that experience. Um, otherwise, it's, it's, it's just you're becoming another person who collect lots of certifications, but when you're actually trying to do the job, you don't know what you're doing. Yeah. Uh, really important i think um so start if you don't know where to start start with youtube mm -hmm. that's the source um i think that's that's what i would say to my younger self mm -hmm. right yeah, and then yep. and like in india like uh, government of india also offers internship we have digital india internship program where you know students uh, can join for two three months and they are trained on the uh, you know cyber security and related domains so that is an opportunity which I think uh, uh, a student should be aware of that, that you know, government uh, of India offers Digital India internship scheme twice a year. Right. That's really good, Dr. Gaurgupta, sir. It's, it's a very good initiative that the government is doing. So on that note, since you're talking about governments, I would like to pivot to security and governance. So this is directed towards Vandana, ma'am, because I may or may not have stopped your LinkedIn, but I know you have a background in cyber law. So how do you think one should uh, proceed with this career? And let's say I have, I have seen one of my very good buddies from work. He's a lawyer and he works in the cyber landscape and he gets paid way more than anyone else who is even a software developer or something. So two cents on governance and like compliance related stuff. Vandana, ma'am, over to you. Sure. So my perspective is that people have taken compliance as just a checklist, which is not the case. Mm -hmm. We have to consider that this is the basic thing, which if we start considering it right, then it solves a lot of problems. When we talk about all these technical controls, they actually come as part of the compliance itself. Because I've been on, uh, on a side wherein I've been part of the technical things. At the same time, when I started learning more about laws, they have things to say, okay, if you don't do this, there, this is going to be applied to you. If you don't do that, this is going to be applied to you. But in a very nutshell, we mm -hmm. all should have in the back of our mind, be it organizations, be it individuals, that there can be things which can go wrong. Wherein, if we start taking things from a compliance perspective as just, okay, if I'm just done with this, I think I'm good. Right. It is never going to suffice. But... Yeah. Compliance, laws, all of these have different perspectives. They're not all same, but they're still same in some way. Right. So let's start considering that laws will step into picture when things go wrong or things can go wrong. 
from a legal perspective. When it comes to compliance, compliance, what people are taking as specifically from standards perspective, SOC, PCI, HIPAA, whatnot, mm -hmm. which you have to comply. But then if you start complying to those, half of the technical things will already be made there. Yeah, you're very right, Vandana, ma'am. And this resonates with what Chani ma'am was saying about the certifications. Like, if certifications is for a person and compliance is for an organization, it's not just about completing the checklist. You may have a lot of certifications or comply with a lot of standards, but that doesn't mean you're actually safe. You need to look at, like, the full picture. But, yeah, that was a but wonderful time with you all, but we are reaching the end of our allotted time and not taking any more time. We would take some questions from the audience. If Is everyone fine with that? Yeah. Thank you. So, audience, any questions, please shoot in the comments. Okay, let's give them some time. <laughs> Wonderful <laughs> audience. Lots of emoji, but no questions. <laughs> that that so shows that they're so... during the talk. Yeah. Yes, sir. It's funny. Okay, so until then, I have I have a question. So this is again, this is again on the governance part of the things. So this is my personal belief that we have GDPR in Europe, we have California data protection law, we see, we have PCI, but other countries they don't really have any data protection laws like for sure. And uh, I, this is like uh, Gorasa, you can also answer this. This is like, do you think since like the internet is not limited by political boundaries? So do you think there should be like a overlooking, overarching organization which actually like uh, set some standards or set some laws? I know IEEE set standards for Wi-Fi and stuff, but what about cybersecurity? What's your thought? So Vandana UN, Gaurav, sir. Yeah, so UN actually has frameworks which most countries adopt or, you know, derive their laws are. And then, you know, one more important thing which we need to understand is the penetration, right? You know, once upon a time, we did not have penetration of internet and, and smartphones in India. And we had IT Act, Information Technology Act. But now, since proliferation have happened, you know, people are more and more using technology and are dependent, or IT Act amendments are taking place. So, you know, right. for, for ensuring the safety and security of Indian citizens, uh, we the government has recently come out with the uh, IT rules where, you know, all the tech majors has to comply, uh, which is basically to ensure safety and security of the citizens of the country. So, right. You know, uh, each country has their own sensibilities and, you know, uh, or uh, their own issues. So the, 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 there could be a common framework, but laws has to be individual. And based on the crimes and based on the issues faced by the country, I'm sure that each country is evolving their own uh, legal frameworks to, you know, ensure the safety and security of their citizens in the digital world. Right, right, sir. Vandama, any additions to this? I think uh, most of the things uh, uh, Gaurav has mentioned, but I would say in very nutshell, the mm -hmm. basic practices that, uh, that the countries are providing, they're very good. Especially in India, there are many uh, advisories that come out. It is just that it doesn't reach the right people. We're talking right. about digital India. At the same time, we need to make sure that the people who don't have technology at all, Mm -hmm. We try and reach there. So probably right. we need to have advocates who reach there and provide the information in the regional languages. If we specifically talk about India, it needs it. We cannot right. say that we have digital India and it will reach everywhere. Yeah, and just to add on, we have recently Ministry of Electronics has started an initiative, Bhasha Vahini, where, you know, mm -hmm. whatever is there will be provided in most Indian languages, oh. including government initiatives. Right. It was recently launched two, three weeks back. That's really cool. That's a great way of overcoming the language barrier in the country. But moving on to the questions from the audience, uh, Sanika asks, are there any good AI ML algorithms which modern day tech companies can use and combine to further improve cybersecurity? I think this goes on the lines of, is there something which automatically flags fraudulent things or attacks so that someone can look into it? So open, open floor, anyone can answer this. Yeah, if, if I can add that, so most of the big tech giant, Microsoft, AWS, Google, CrowdStrike, they all are using this AI and ML algorithm within their product because right. it's not humanly uh, possible to analyze all the trillions and trillions of log and the, and the signal which they collect for securing the uh, end user computers as well as the end users who are using their product, right? 
So if I give you example, the antivirus, a good example is uh, Microsoft Defender antivirus, which you have for free in your mm -hmm. Windows 10 or Windows 11 laptop uh, operating system if you are using it. They don't, uh, Microsoft do not update those that file any longer. They are based on the behaviors and oh. the signal what they collect. So if there is any misbehavior happening on your device, the antivirus or anti-malware will pick up those behavior and it will block that particular activity in your, in your in your laptop. And this is based because of the machine learning algorithm which they have developed by collecting almost 64 trillion signals on a daily basis. And, and they have almost 4 million malware sample in their malware zoo, which right. they learn out of how they behave internally. So they right. feed that algorithm and use those uh, al uh, algorithm within the product so it can be immediately secure without even updating those product uh, uh, remotely. You know? That's one example. Very rightly said. Marvel Zoo, uh, Malware Zoo is a very interesting word. I like that. <laughs> Moving <laughs> on to the next question. Pratik asks, uh, what is protocol if we are targeted by a cyber attack? This is a very good disaster management question. So, so anyone who wants to has yep. NIST has guidelines of first responder. Uh, and then, you know, I think uh, enterprises are preparing uh, some people in, you know, in their organization who are first responder to any incident. It's like if there's a fire, you call some numbers, right? Similarly, if there is an incident, you reach out to the first responder who knows what to do. Ideally, as a user, you should not do anything uh, other than reporting it to the right person because that right person will know what are the first responder guidelines, you know, what not to do because, you know, uh, let's say if there is a crime going on to your laptop, only thing you can do is to isolate it, you know, remove the network connection then, and then report it. So there are, uh, each organization is encouraged and required to make their own first responder guidelines depending on the nature of their, uh, you know, uh, Pro, you know what kind of businesses they are in and so on right right that's really cool okay so i see end of q and a session so yeah that's my cue but uh it was wonderful having each and single one of you thank you so much for talking to all the students and thank you for bearing with my bad jokes as well so i think i'll hand over to kiran to do the vote of thanks and the closing thank you that was a brilliant and insightful discussion. I'm sure that our audience has taken away valuable key points from the session. So with that, we have come to an end with our session. I hope everyone's doubts are clear. I would now like to thank all our panelists and our moderator for enlightening us with their valuable experience and knowledge. With that being said, we have come to the end of our panel discussion. I would now like to present all the panelists with a small token of gratitude. Starting with Pamela Ma'am. Thank you, ma'am, for joining us today. I would now like to present Chani Ma'am a small token of gratitude. Thank you, ma'am, for being with us today. Next is for Abbas, sir. Thank you, sir, for being us with us today. And next is for Gaurav, sir. Thank you, Gaurav, sir, for being with us today. Next token of gratitude is for Vandana, ma'am. Thank you, ma'am, for coming at the last moment and joining us with us today. And last but not the least, our very own special Arya, sir, for being the moderator and conducting the session. Thank you, sir. Thank, Thank you. you, everyone, for being a part of Epsilon 2022. Thank you very much and all the best to you guys. Thanks everyone. Nice meeting you all. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye. So, audience, don't forget to submit the task which is pinned in the comment section right now before the deadline, which is August 15 till 11.59 p.m. And keep your spot on the scoreboard. Further, I would like to express our gratitude to our sponsors for their support. Starting from IEEE MDTS, we are grateful to have them as our sponsors for the successful execution of our event. Further, we have our title sponsor, IMFS. Founded in 1997, was the first institution in India to deliver expert coaching for examinations like GRE, GMAT, SAT, TOEFL, IELTS, and PTE. 
they provide professional counseling as well as platform with a huge and active alumni network and strong links to over 500 institute across the globe next up is aurora coaching aurora coaching is a educational partner it is a crypto coaching coaching service which seeks to educate and and empower people and organizations about the world of cryptocurrency so that both may approach it with some confidence our streaming partner is streamyard one of the streamyard platform you have broadcast over social net networks directly from your browser before choosing the premium plans to gain access to more features it provides a free option that may, you may test out with this we come to an end to the cyber security conclave domain of the second edition of epsilon 2022 which have been one of the most remarkable thus far we would like to thank all the participants present here for attending the session and we hope that everyone has had a glimpse into the domain of cyber security stay tuned guys and see you all at sharp 2 for our next upcoming mtts valiant vulnerability session wherein we will explore the vulnerabilities in 5g and iot system thank you everyone have a good day